Hi friends, today we're gonna discuss how to shop for a good multivitamin or cold supplement. There's a sea of bad supplements. Grab your supplement bottles and packets and let's navigate this ocean together. Now, the first question you should consider when buying a supplement is, how's your digestion? Can you swallow the supplement? Some supplements look like horse pills. It's not uncommon that they may just sit in your stomach if you have digestion issue. If this is the case, try a powder formulation or you may have to crush it, but that may taste a bit bitter. So let's start eliminating ingredients. Flip your bottle or box over, and if you see any artificial colors, put that away, don't take it. You don't need any more chemicals that add stress and inflammation to your body. That's also true for artificial flavors. Don't take any supplements or eat any foods with artificial colors. Now these colors and flavors, they're trying to make it look like candy. Let's face it, micronutrients don't taste good. They're not candy, they're not food. So this comes to gummifying supplements. Gummies will just give you cavities, give you extra calories, save those calories for real food. And if there's any copper in your supplement, don't take it. Unless you're deficient and instructed by your own personal medical doctor, copper is not good for you. Excess copper can lead to potentially dementia. If you're looking for a combination supplement, like a multivitamin, energy supplement, or immune supplement, I weave the supplements with just two basic but essential vitamins, and that is vitamin B1 and vitamin B2. Many vitamins will only have B1 and not B2, and that tells me they don't understand the basic principles of energy, immunity, and health. So many people have forgotten how these two basic vitamins are great for your health and metabolism and essential for every organ. So if your immune supplement or multivitamin doesn't have both, I won't read any further. I'll just put that back on the shelf. Now it's critical that they get the amount of riboflavin and thiamine right. This is where I'm gonna have to get a little bit more technical, but I'm gonna try to keep it as simple as possible. We're gonna go through who needs them, which is basically everyone. And we're gonna talk about the signs and symptoms if you're deficient or inadequate. And lastly, we're gonna talk about how much you need. In the 1800s, when processed grains became a staple for thousands of people in Asia, they noticed Thoughts of people would get weak and die. And their diet centered on polished rice, which is white rice. It's tasty, but not so nutritious. They fed chickens white rice, and they also got weak and died. And then they gave chickens the husk back, and the, those chickens actually lived. And the difference was thiamine. It was in the husk. The discovery of thiamine actually won a Nobel Prize. Now, this is the, another reason why brown rice is more nutritious than white rice. Thiamine is essential for life. It's essential for energy, for good mental health, for your nervous system, for immune health, for your mitochondria. Really, without it, your memory will falter, your vision will fail, your energy will fade, your muscles will grow weak, your gut will get irritable, and you will have more pain and skin problems. Thiamine deficiency literally causes brain failure, a condition known as Wernicke's encephalopathy and heart failure called beriberi. This is so important that governments got with processed food companies to fortify flour to prevent absolute thiamine deficiency. But the kicker is, the more flour, sugar and carbohydrates you eat, the more thiamine you need. How many of you drink a cup of coffee with your toast in the morning? Coffee contains tannins and so does tea and chocolate, energy drinks and sodas. Tannins inhibit thiamine absorption. Another for sure way to get thiamine deficient is to overuse alcohol. And if you have absorption problems like inflammatory bowel disease or basically a gastric bypass, then you can also be thiamine deficient. Restrictions such as fasting diets or calorie restricted diets are at higher risk or diabetes. Exercising too much if you have surgery on dialysis or diuretics. Really, so many people are at risk. So even if you absorb enough dietary thiamine, if you eat food that breaks it down, foods that have thiaminases, which are enzymes that destroy thiamine, you can get severely thiamine deficient. So if you eat raw sushi and eat raw mackerel, tuna, or shellfish, you not only have to worry about food poisoning and parasites, but also thiamine deficiency. Now cooking can significantly decrease thiaminases and food poisoning too, but anchovies and certain plants like beetle nuts and teas have thiaminases. Even fish that eat fish can get thiamine deficient. But there are lots of real foods, whole foods that are thiamine rich, like whole grains, yeast, legumes, and beans, but people aren't eating them. Other less healthy sources are eating trout and pork. But if you're on a diet, if you're fasting, 
if you're you're probably not getting an adequate amount of thymine. Now it's estimated that about 30% of people who are in these categories may be thymine deficient. Now thymine isn't studied much anymore because it's cheap to replace and there really isn't a toxic dose. You can buy thymine so cheaply in your stores. But societies are struggling so much with fatigue, mental health issues, they're having dementia, heart failure, chronic pain. Those are just some of the things that maybe replacing thymine could help. I still see thymine deficiency. Severe deficiency gives you serious heart and brain failure. You can get deficient when you're septic. And so inadequate levels also reduce your recovery. And when you get a cold, when you are exercising more or moving around more, when you're eating more carbohydrates, you need more thymine. Now the RDA is 1.2 milligrams a day for people who are healthy and unstressed. You can't store thymine. You need to take it daily and your needs actually change depending on what you're doing for the day. I know I'm constantly bombarded by stress. I skip meals, I'm always walking around, I'm always doing something that gives me both physical stress as well as mental stress. And I know I need thiamine throughout the day. And when I don't sleep well, or when I'm working too hard, I'm gonna need extra thiamine. But those are actually the stresses that I could control a little bit. But what about the allergies from the pollen in the air, from the air pollution, from the toxins in the food and water? Those are stresses we don't see and they still require us to need thiamine. Unfortunately, thiamine deficiency goes unrecognized because it's confused with a lot of other symptoms such as dry skin and people uh, treat it with lotions instead of actually treating the root cause. Severe deficiencies versus inadequacies are usually diagnosed post-mortem. That means after death. It's super easy to ensure adequate thiamine levels because the supplements are super cheap. Most common form of thiamine is found in supplements in the formulation of thiamine hydrochloride. And guess what? When you take thiamine hydrochloride, you really only absorb about 5%. So if you want the RDA recommended amount of thiamine, 1.2 milligrams, then you have to eat so much more. Your supplement has to be more like 25 milligrams in order for you to meet the RDA requirements. But the average multivitamin may only have 1.2 milligrams and they're just putting a random number and that tells me they really don't understand how the body works. If your supplement only has 1.2 milligrams, you're only absorbing 5%, you're only getting 0.06 milligrams that is severely deficient of what your body needs for the day. And if you're eating more carbohydrates, drinking more sugary products and liquids, you're gonna need more thymine, even if you don't do anything else. And thymine is a water soluble vitamin, so this is why it's hard to get toxic. In fact, there's no known toxicity of high thymine levels. And I easily give 100 milligrams intravenously when I see that people need it. There's, you know, any extra, they just urinate that out. And the more you take, the more you absorb in your blood. It peaks at about four hours, so it's really not uncommon for physicians to give you thymine more than once a day. But if a physician is giving you thymine because you're deficient, that means you have symptoms and that's what we wanna avoid. You may wonder what is the highest amount we've ever used. Actually in the medical literature, people have used 1500 milligrams to replace thymine. And really at that point, you've capped at what you can absorb. So you're not gonna absorb anymore if you take more thymine. That's actually a lot of thymine. So check your supplement bottles. If it doesn't have at least 20 to 25 milligrams, probably not enough for you unless you're getting it in another source. Riboflavin is critical for metabolizing iron, vitamin B6, and niacin. It also supports the work of folate. There's actually a syndrome called the oral ocular genital syndrome that indicates severe B2 deficiency, possibly interfering with collagen synthesis, which is not just important for your skin. It's actually the glue for your entire body. Now on your skin, which is also in your mouth, on your eye and in the private parts, as well as your GI tract, um, as well as what you see on the outside of your body, riboflavin deficiency severely affects this organ. And you'll see inflammatory red patches, especially around the folds of your face, chapped lips, cracked angles called angular helitis. Your tongue may initially swell and then it becomes very smooth and a beefy red color. You may also get sun sensitive, burning eyes, as well as irritation called conjunctivitis. Now this can all contribute to cataracts. Now even though some foods are fortified with riboflavin, it's really 
Most snacks and junk foods are not. And you don't have to have all these symptoms to be vitamin B12 inadequate. Unfortunately, because no deaths have been reported, riboflavin deficiency goes under recognized and few people pay attention to it. You may look and feel bad, but you're not gonna die unlike vitamin B1. Fun fact, riboflavin is also known as a treatment for migraine headaches. Now, if you have no absorption issues and if you're eating real food and not processed foods, you are likely to meet your recommended daily allowance, which is about 1.1 to 1.3 milligrams a day. There's really no known toxicities with taking more riboflavin, just like vitamin. The RDA is the minimal amount you need for a healthy, unstressed adult. It's like filling a gas tank and just enough to make it home, right? Now, I'm a big proponent to having more than enough. This is true for my gas tank as well as for my essential vitamins like riboflavin, especially if you are on any kind of calorie restriction or a vegetarian diet, or you have a physically active job or struggling with any kind of stress, you better make sure you tank up to feel better. Now, supplementing is easy to do. So check your supplement bottles. If it doesn't have about 25 milligrams of a supplement, because anything beyond 27 milligrams is poorly absorbed. However, studies have used hundreds of milligrams of riboflavin to treat migraine headaches. And anything in excess is peed or pooped out. And I'm sure if this was studied today, we're gonna have more mechanisms and more of a better dosing, but you know, it's too cheap for anybody to invest in it. These vitamins are off patent, so there's really no money in it for Big Pharma. Because I couldn't find a clean supplement that combined the right proportions of essential nutrients, especially thiamine and riboflavin, I actually formulated my own to share with my friends and family. It's called NACPRO Plus, and I take it once daily. And if you're interested in trying this supplement, I put a link for you in the description below. Now, if you wanna learn more about foods, Check out this video on the top 10 immune boosting foods you must eat.